this model recommends that districts or jurisdictions develop clear and consistent policies and criteria regarding when you're going to revoke somebody for having contact with a victim or if you're going to revoke. What type of contact, under what circumstances? At, at what point, how are you going to decide that your district needs to revoke somebody's uh, supervised release? And I know that this is you know, beyond your control, and I know that there are many forces that impinge uh, upon this. And, and don't get me wrong, I don't mean to say this is what you should be doing. I'm presenting a model. If you can extract from this model something that is useful to you, uh, please do so. Certainly as general guidelines, we encourage you to do ongoing assessment. I, I talked uh, earlier this morning about risk being a dynamic uh, construct, something that changes all the time. You need ongoing assessment. Now, this is not mental health assessment. This is your assessment to ensure that the current conditions of supervision appropriately address the offender's changing level of risk. That is something that requires considerable professional judgment because you have to re-evaluate, reassess the conditions as they change over time. We also recommend that you do something that treatment providers do in the form of a treatment plan. Simply stated, treatment providers come up with, uh, identify the problem, come up with a treatment plan that offers solutions to the problem or interventions to the problem. The case plan is uh, very similar and you may already do this as part of your routine uh, management and supervision of the offender. Yeah, develop an individualized plan of relapse prevention, support, and supervision. So this is not just supervision. What type of support, what type of treatment, and how are you going to establish certain conditions that will prevent this uh, uh, particular offender from reoffending and from uh, violating the conditions of supervision? Very important one is the relationship with the offender. It is very important to develop a working alliance with the offender. In the field of psychotherapy, we have long recognized that one of the most powerful uh, interventions that we have to offer have to do with the therapeutic alliance, the working relationship with our patients. And if that relationship is good, one that uh, offers mutual respect, one that has clear and firm boundaries, one that is genuinely helpful, that has a positive treatment effect. Another very important role of the relationship with the uh, offender is what we can do in, in treatment, what I tell them uh, and what I try to convey to them that part of their goal in treatment is to internalize, and this is a, a term that we use in, in, uh, in therapy a lot, internalize the functions of the treatment provider, the functions of treatment. What does treatment do? Well, treatment, for example, in this uh, program, in the SOTP, gives them a reminder several times a week at certain times. It reminds them that they are sex offenders, that they shouldn't forget that, that they need to be working on their problems. So we remind them by putting them on, um, a, uh, I was gonna say put them on the call out, but that means nothing to you. Uh, we, we actually schedule appointments several times a week. So these are reminders. When we talk to them, when we confront them, when we support them, these are all functions that they should be doing within themselves. They should be doing this as I question my behavior, as I analyze my behavior, scrutinize my behavior, they should be doing the same thing. So they should take the function of the therapist, one of confrontation, and they should be confronting themselves. 
They should be analyzing their behavior. They should not need a therapist who performs that function outside of them. So the, the, the ultimate goal of treatment is really the in internalization of these functions. These are functions that service providers, supervision officers such as yourselves, treatment providers such as I am, engage in, but ultimately each offender should be able to internalize these functions so that they can do it onto themselves. Does that make sense? All right. I've, I've gotten calls from uh, probation officers saying, well, what should we recommend? Uh, is there anything that we should add to the uh, conditions of uh, supervision? What, what type of language should we use? And over the course of my uh, experience with uh, sex offenders, I've come up with several uh, conditions that probably ought to be included routinely in, uh, in supervision contracts. So in addition, this is again in addition to the standard conditions of supervised uh, release, I would encourage you to specifically address contact with the victim, contact with minors, offender-specific sexual risk factors, and offender-specific behavioral restrictions. Now, what do I mean by contact with a victim? Well, if you can look at the condition of contact with the victim on a continuum, we psychologists have a difficult time seeing things in very discrete categories, so everything is a continuum. But we start from the most restrictive end of the continuum, absolutely no contact with the victim, and then move up. Contact supervised by an agent of the court or child protection worker. Less restrictive, contact supervised by a responsible person approved by the probation officer. This may be uh, a caregiver, a mother, a grandmother, grandfather, anyone that you trust will be an appropriate supervisor of that contact. Supervision only after a successful course of family reunification therapy. By virtue of somebody being uh, a parent of a child, father, mother, that does not make that person appropriate to supervise, necessarily appropriate to supervise the contact between a sex offender and his victim. All too frequently, particularly when I was working in uh, community-based uh, treatment programs, this issue came up a lot, where traditionally the mother sometimes was not in a position in which she could supervise the visit. Some, sometimes her behavior was one that enabled the offender behavior, minimized the conduct, blamed the victim. So that is very inappropriate to have a person who's exhibiting those behaviors can be very traumatizing and, and further damaging to that victim child. Family reunification therapy, a very unique uh, form of therapy with specific uh, goals, can sometimes prepare a caregiver to be an appropriate supervisor of that contact so that an appropriate safety plan for the home can be developed. And finally, on the other end of the spectrum, we have unsupervised contact with the victim without any particular restrictions. I don't think you would want that. What do we mean by contact with uh, minors? Again, on a uh, continuum, absolutely no contact whatsoever with minors, even if supervised. I think that's pretty clear. Uh, contact supervised by a person approved by an agent of the court or, or other similar person, such as a child protection worker. Contact with minors only in the presence of a responsible 
uh, of responsible adults. These may be chaperones, may be individuals who provide some degree of supervision but may not be uh, as uh, trained in the supervision of uh, the individual. And finally, unsupervised contact with minors. What are some of the sexual risk factors? I mentioned this before. These are the uh, offender specific. Again, you have to look at the offender and that uh, individual offender's sexual offense history. And based on that, you will determine what are the risk factors that uh, pertain to that individual. Typically, pornography is not a good thing. I think pornography, what it does, there's a good meta-analysis that uh, uh, makes this argument that came out just a few weeks ago on the effect of pornography um, on, uh, on the sex offender population. And what pornography does in many ways is it systematically desensitizes the individual to accept what the images are presenting. There's a, a, a more of a readiness to accept if the, if the pornography depicts violence and sexual violence, there is more of a readiness to accept that. There is a systematic desensitization to violence through the pairing of sexual stimuli and violence. For child pornography, what a lot of these offenders uh, uh, encounter is there is a systematic desensitization to the wrongfulness of child pornography because they see images of children who are posed and are uh, you know, allegedly having a good time and they see, oh, that boy has an erection so he must like it, he must be enjoying himself and fail to see beyond that. So there is a s systematic desensitization. Pornography is not a good thing and, and should be uh, uh, not permitted for any sex offender. Any materials that portray, depict, or describe sexual violence and exploitation, that, that, that's very broad and that may or may not include pornography. Other uh, offender specific uh, risk factors, places where children congregate, especially unsupervised. Uh, arcades, video arcades, malls, uh, well, you name them, uh, it's, it's, it's not very difficult to come up with them. And finally, contact with other sex offenders and so-called enablers. Again, these are people who minimize the offender's uh, conduct, say, well, you know, it's not bad. You know, these people are just persecuting you. Uh, you know, you're, you're an upstanding uh, uh, citizen of, of this community, and uh, they enable the offender's denial, minimization, and lack of effective self-control. Yes, sir. Are there groups of organizations, names of groups of organizations that we could be on the lookout for? Uh, I know of two. The Orchid Club in Nambla. Nambla is, uh, is actually a, probably one of the most dangerous organizations we have in this uh, country. Um, and uh, they are public. Headquarters in New York. They have a newsletter free to any inmate who requests uh, the uh, newsletter. Uh, and they publicly advocate for sexual contact with uh, boys, with minors. They cite even biblical passages uh, indicating that uh, uh, sex with minors, sex with boys, uh, between adults and boys is a positive thing, it's a healthy thing, and uh, uh, they simply say that uh, the law is wrong and they challenge the law and they are public, uh, publicly identified pedophiles. Many of them are convicted. Many of them have gone uh, uh, undetected for many years. Uh, in the treatment program, I've had uh, individuals who have been contributors, subscribers to uh, NAMBLA, um, and uh, I, I suspect that uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a different world. Let's uh, move on. Now, what are some of the uh, behavioral restrictions that you as probation officers can impose on, uh, on some of these offenders. In the employment realm, certainly uh, limitations uh, to the uh, 
internet, access to the internet and telephone, or at least that uh, they can be fully accountable to what they do with the telephone. These people shouldn't be calling one of these uh, you know, sex lines, and you should be able to pull up their, their phone record and, and examine that. Again, we've uh, addressed this before. Uh, unsupervised, unstructured jobs are not good for most sex offenders. They need to be accountable at all times. A guy who's uh, uh, reading meters, electric meters, has very little accountability and uh, a great deal of access to potential victims. Delivery uh, uh, truck, uh, truck drivers, uh, delivery uh, truck drivers, uh, certainly those people have very limited accountability. Plumbers, air conditioning uh, repair uh, uh, persons. Okay, what about in the realm of social, spiritual uh, activities? Very important that, and I would encourage you to scrutinize their tendency, for some of them, their tendency to position themselves in places of authority and trust within social and spiritual religious organizations, particularly if they have access to potential victims or have access to the parents of those victims. I've seen it far too many times where the, uh, some of these offenders will position themselves in uh, as ministers and as counselors to adults, they gain the uh, trust, sometimes the blind trust of uh, the adults, the parents, and then have full access to their children. Again, in, in their recreational activities, please uh, scrutinize <coughs> any activity where there is reduced accountability, anonymity, or proximity to potential victims. Can you think of any Recreational activities, leisure activities. Where anyone? Baseball coach? Boy Scouts? Camping? At the beach? Going to the fair? Yes. Oh, gosh. A lot of volunteer roles? Yes. Uh, a lot of kids. You, said, you mentioned the fair. Uh, it reminded me of... of uh, offenders and, and, and uh, what they report, and it's, it's amazing. And, and uh, um, you know, I have a two-year-old uh, two uh, little boy, and uh, I hope I don't traumatize him with, uh, you know, uh, restrictive uh, behavioral uh, conditions I'll place on him, because uh, I don't think he's going to Boy Scouts. Uh. <laughs> okay, housing. Access and proximity to potential victims and other risk factors such as alcohol and drugs. I, I, and I think you're very sensitized to, uh, to this uh, particular uh, factor and instead of behavioral restrictions. Oh, question. Anyone had a question? Yes, sir. This kind of goes back to the management team uh, quest or approach. Do you use a management team approach in the program here? And also, to what degree does the offender know out on supervision or should they know um, the network monitors, um, the different people that are checking on them. Do we use a, a management team uh, in, uh, in the program? To a large degree, we, we do. Because we uh, are not only their treatment providers in prison, but we're also their uh, supervision officers, and we're also the cops. Okay? Uh, so we have multiple roles as treatment providers. We also function to uh, collaborate with other disciplines, correctional services, the captain, if they need to be locked up uh, for how long, that sort of thing, with the unit disciplinary committee. If uh, they get in trouble, they get an incident report, what type of sanction? We do inform that process. Um, we also want to know how they're doing, what they're doing outside of their uh, uh, treatment, uh, of the treatment realm. We want to know how they're doing at work. Are they getting uh, in trouble for other behavior elsewhere? And we have set up those uh, communication channels so that we receive that information as well as give that information. The second part of your question was? To what degree do you feel that the offender should know there's monitors in his in town and 
the offender should have full and complete knowledge of the monitors. In fact, he should be instrumental in identifying those monitors. And he should present himself as open to work with that approach. Otherwise, that tells you that he wants to uh, lead a deceptive and uh, secretive uh, lifestyle, and therefore then you are going to be less trusting and supervise him more intensively. And by doing that in prison, you're starting the process. He's getting used to it. He's learning the honesty to be open. Absolutely. Outside. That's, that's uh, in, in the comment was, by starting this in prison, that uh, enables them to get, to get accustomed to this out in the community. Of course, that is, that is the aim. Uh, we, we want them to prepare themselves for that kind of uh, uh, experience out in the community. Absolutely. Uh, question, where? Uh, with the, the, the internet. If anybody has any ideas or you have any suggestions as to how you go about, you know, securing or searching their, their internet, which, you know, a lot of these guys are really pretty sophisticated as to how they can hide and download and uh, what strategies have been used in some of the districts and looking into that. You know, I, I am not all that, uh, uh, I'm not up on all the uh, most recent technology in terms of detection and, and learning about the uh, history and where that uh, individual has gone uh, in the computer. My, my recommendation is uh, internet offenders should not have access to the internet. That's, that's like giving a person a, a pyromaniac, you know, having them play with fire. Why would they want to be exposed to that if it's such a powerful uh, risk factor? You know, they, they may not be looking at pornography on the Internet, but these people have, have spent hundreds of hours looking at child pornography and other garbage on the computer. They've spent, they've spent hundreds of hours masturbating in front of a computer. So even if they're looking at the stock market on the computer, that is still a risk factor. One, one part of, of this is pornography. The other part is chat rooms. And you also want to uh, develop conditions that stop offenders from communicating with other offenders about sexually explicit materials. And that can further their criminal, criminal activity, their sexual deviance, and not a single picture has been transmitted. So it's, it's, very, it, it's a very tricky thing. A question back there. Uh, yes, Dr. Hernandez, what do you do when the materials are not offensive in nature? such as I had a known uh, pedophile that had 40 to 50 Disney tapes and no children were present in the home. My question is, would be the same thing as having a toy in front of the, uh, or a series of toys in your front porch. I would look at them as lures of uh, children. Uh, now, if, if, they, if they have a proven history of being avid uh, Mickey Mouse uh, collectors, you know, prior to the instant offense and all of that, well, you know, exercise your best judgment. Uh, but I, I would look at that uh, with, uh, with a great deal of suspicion. Ideally, I again want to emphasize that. You want to have specialized in small caseloads. It's impossible really to supervise an offender effectively if you have 80 people on your caseload. It's simply impossible. We need to allocate uh, resources so that you can do your job and you can do it well. We need to be able to increase the continuity of supervision so that the offender doesn't go through six probation officers in, in the period of supervision, uh, uh, the, the supervised uh, release period. There ought to be continuity of service, ongoing and, uh, training and supervision, opportunities like this. Um, I, I hope that you know some of you can also have uh, training uh, programs such as this, and I can come in and learn from you and what you have to you know offer. Uh, so this is a, a, a thing that, wor that works both ways. Supervision you need to be able to have some technical assistance. You need, to, you need to be able to pick up the phone or go to somebody's office and ask for help. How, how can I effect good, a good supervision plan for this uh, individual? 
you need to have that uh, support. Availability and support of, that's a key word, competent treatment providers. I, I, and I recognize that some of you who practice and, and have uh, individuals in more rural areas may not have access to treatment providers. But there may be good practitioners in that community who are willing to take on this population, get some additional training, and offer good services. They may not be the optimal services, but they may be good enough if they are good practitioners. So sometimes you just got to work with what you have. Again, integration of treatment and supervision, and I should also add here in polygraph services. Some people refer to this as the triangle of supervision. This also goes to communication um, among the, uh, the management team members. And finally, power and discretion to apply pre-revocation sanctions so that you can hold the, uh, the offender immediately accountable for violations. Very important so that you have the power to sanction the inmate, the uh, offender, immediately. That is a, a very important behavioral principle. If the punishment comes three months later, it has very little power. If it comes immediately, it has uh, uh, a very powerful effect, particularly if it's commensurate with the degree or nature of the offense. The sanction has to match the nature or severity of the offense. If it's less powerful than, uh, than uh, the uh, severity of the offense, it will not have the uh, desired effect. It, it must at least meet that level of severity. Does that make sense? Okay. Ma'am. Okay. I was hoping you wouldn't ask that. 12-step uh, support groups. What about that? I think that for many people, those are very helpful. But I've seen many sex offenders use the 12 steps inappropriately to disown responsibility and to misguide the process of treatment and quote unquote recovery. I think the 12 steps are very good in concept. If applied correctly and with integrity, they can have a very powerful powerful effect on human behavior and addictive type of behavior. And this is the first time I've mentioned the word addiction because I don't subs subscribe to the, uh, the notion of addiction in sexual offending behavior. And I have only limited uh, adherence or, or allegiance to the notion of psychiatric disorder. I treat criminals and I treat their criminal behavior. So yes, the 12 steps uh, can have a, a, a very important place, uh, but I would be very cautious of the inappropriate use of the 12 steps, particularly to minimize uh, the uh, importance or the gravity of their offense uh, behavior and to also disown responsibility for the recovery. Any other questions before we take a break? So let's go ahead and take a break We thank Dr. Hernandez and everyone at FCI Butner for making this conference an invaluable experience. A great deal of thanks also goes out to all of our participants. Without their questions and comments, we would not have had the engaging discussions we did. Now, for more information on the sex offender treatment program at FCI Butner, contact Dr. Hernandez directly by phone at 919-575-4541, extension 4462, or by email at aehernandez at bop.gov. Investigation and supervision of sex offenders pose unique challenges and concerns to all pretrial services and probation officers. We hope this two-part program addressed some of those concerns and offered practical information that you can take with you when you're working with this offender population. Now please fill out your evaluations and let us know if we succeeded in meeting your needs and how we might improve future broadcasts. Also remember to fax your evaluations and rosters to us following the broadcast. 
we do use your feedback to design future programs. On behalf of the Federal Judicial Center, I'm Mark Maggio. Thank you for watching. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.